Today on the show, we are joined by Dr. Andy Galpin, a professor and scientist. Uh, Andy, such a pleasure having you here on the show. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, glad we finally connected after a little bit of scheduling issues on my end. So that's all good, man. It's all good. It's uh, the it's been uh, an excitement, an exciting time for us waiting for this one. So just happy you. Um, so I'm curious, your PhD specialized in bioenergetics. Uh, when I, I told a friend, they, they described, they said, that sounds really cool. And they wanted to kind of know more. So I'd just love to know, what kind of age did you get interest really in human performance or bioenergetics? And kind of what really interested you about that? Well, I guess I was always interested in muscle from the time I can remember. Uh, so I some context, you know, I grew up in an area where sports were very prevalent and I had an older brother who was bigger and stronger and uh, just everyone I grew up with was very interested in sport. So yeah, I just wanted to get better, I guess is the most correct way. And then as I moved out of high school and into college and played college football, this would be the American version of that sport. Um, the same sort of issue, right? I'm just not physically the biggest strongest etc so i just i just wanted to get better and the most direct place for that is muscle so i just wanted to figure out how my muscles could work better and run faster and recover faster and on all those things so i sort of just thought how can i create myself a career where i could just be around muscle and <laughs> that's pretty cool and then i kind of stumbled my way actually into a national strength and conditioning association um, national conference and I had no idea. I had finished my undergraduate, and at that point, there was only education and what I would call more like public health, right? So, how do we take blood pressure and get people to walk more and take the stairs and things? And it, that just could not be less interesting to me. <laughs> so, I'm at this conference and I'm walking around, and basically, what happens is scientists present research posters, and they literally stand by a giant poster of, you know, their most recent findings and there's hundreds of posters all up and down this place and I walk by one and it's a poster of a guy who had done a study and he had taken a muscle biopsy from people the individuals had done a one rep max squat so as heavy as they possibly can and they did 10 sets of that and they did it every single day for like 14 days and they took a muscle biopsy at the end then let him recover for like seven or ten days and took a biopsy at the end and I was like what like this is science like, well, what the hell's going on? And I just berated this poor guy for like two hours and they had free beer and stuff. So I'll just go back and get like two more beers and come back and give them one. And just my friend Doug Larson <laughs> and I were just crushing this guy with questions. And I just had no idea that you could do performance science and muscle at the same time. And I was just like, what, what's it going to, how do I, how do I do this? And he's like, well, you know, I have some positions open for grad students. And I'm like, what's grad school? What's a master's degree? I mean, I just had no idea. They don't come from a scientific background or family or certainly an area in our country where like I, I never knew anyone who had a master's degree. I never knew anyone, I don't know what a PhD was. Like I had no <laughs> idea, even as a college student, I didn't know what these things were. So um, well, like seven or so beers later, he was like, Hey, if you want to come out to the University of Memphis and do your graduate work in muscle physiology and performance, I would, would love to take you in. Well, that guy ended up being a guy named Andy Fry who just a couple of years ago won the Lifetime Achievement Award and is still crushing as a scientist at University of Kansas and all this stuff. So that's how I kind of got into muscle physiology performance. And I could go on more in my background if you want, or I can stop there. But that's, I guess, how it all started. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I noticed when I was kind of looking through your um, kind of biography that you won a D11 championship as a, an undergrad, D3. Uh, division three yeah. division three um so i'm curious uh because we've interviewed i guess a lot of guys that come from uh particularly the biology field and i'm curious when you look back to perhaps those days uh as an undergrad how has the for the field of i guess performance science changed is it a really fast moving field i'm curious to know what the kind of difference was between then and now well, I'd say the easiest way to think about it was 
that that wasn't a field. Wow. And now it is. So if you want to know how fast it's growing, that's the easiest way I can say it. Again, when I was going on recruiting trips out of high school and everyone was saying kind of like, hey, what do you want to do, business or whatever? And I was like, I just, I want to be performance. And they're just like, oh, okay, like athletic training. And I'm like, no, that's like taping ankles and, you know, giving an athlete a water bottle and an injury. I'm like, no, I want to do like performance stuff. And everyone would just look at me like I was crazy. They're like, well, we, you know, we have athletic training or you can go like pre-med or biology. And I'm just like, I can't believe you can't go to college for this stuff. Well, now, like, <laughs> there's programs all over the country, all over the world for it. There's PhD programs and strength conditioning. There's, there's all kinds of stuff now. So, yeah, I guess over 30 years, it's, it's grown pretty rapidly. That's really interesting. And I remember I was um, watching a video quite recently of uh, Chris Bumstead, the uh, bodybuilder. And I was watching these videos and I was thinking to myself, I- I'm just not sure how much more these guys can actually improve i mean to me i look at it and you know to me it looks like that this really reached the biological limit of what is humanly possible in a physique do you kind of share that opinion or do you think that there is room still for these bodybuilders to get bigger uh perhaps more vascular more tapered because i look at them now and i just think it's it's unbelievable what these guys are doing right now yeah well first and foremost physique and bodybuilding is not my area of tremendous expertise other than, other than the, back when I was a child because that's that's kind of all we had right um so I, I would say my initial reaction is I don't know how much larger much larger they can get they're, they're probably getting close um my only counter to my own argument there is with the technology changes we have now um depends on how far you want you want to talk five years from now you want to talk 50 you want to talk 500 well then we're going to have some different answers, I guess, depending on which time frame you want to look at. Sure. And do you think we kind of like talked about the field that you're in because the amount of variables, I guess, that are involved with biological research, do you think that you're in a harder field to research than other fields? I don't think it's harder. I think all science is hard, man. Um, I think, you know, I have a friend who's a professor at Harvard and economics and <laughs> it's probably very hard to figure out how money works and how do you create a model with thousands and thousands of variables. Sure. I think sport performance is tremendously hard for actual data collection. Um, I, I can make an argument for every field. I think just science is hard. Sure. And we're, we're very grateful for, for the research that comes up. So I guess if we just kind of um, just jump into it um, and kind of today we'll kind of focus the theme, I guess, around um performance i'm curious to know how if someone was interested in structuring their routine for i guess higher performance higher athletic performance how would say someone structure a routine that differs from uh kind of athletic performance as opposed to say something like hypertrophy training or strength training or kind of muscle building how would that they differ okay when you say routine what do you mean just like in terms of what they do week by week, you know, in terms of their gym work and whatnot, perhaps their sleep, their nutrition. Okay, that, that's sort of what I'm getting at. Because yeah, sure. when I think routine, my mind goes to the big picture in terms of there's a bunch of different levers we need to move correctly. So I don't know which one you want me to go into. Do you want me to go into sleep? Do you want me Let's to do it all. Training styles? You Let's train it. Yeah. What, well, that's going to take let's, 600 hours. So. <laughs> let's start with training. And, uh, do, do you want yeah. me to give you a big... Sure, like, big, big overview. Right. Oh, yeah. Overview first? Yeah. Right, okay. So starting off, we have to think about the way that we categorize uh, human performance is you're trying to do some sort of physiological adaptation, right? So whether you want to grow muscle, be stronger, you want to recover faster, you want to just have more energy throughout the day, you want to be happier, it doesn't matter. You're trying to cause some sort of change. That's called adaptation. Well, adaptation is a function of three things. Really, it's stress and recovery, right? Now, I said three, and I just gave you two, but I split up stress into two separate categories. I call them hidden stressors and visible stressors. And really, all that happens here doesn't occur. And what I mean by that is if the stress load is too high and it exceeds the 
ability to recover, then no adaptations occur. Or sometimes you get adaptations, but in the wrong direction, right? So things get worse. If you don't do enough stress, though, there's no impetus for adaptation. So recovery can be as high as you want, but you're not doing anything. So we're playing this stress load recovery game. And if we do that right, we get the right kind of changes. If we don't do it wrong, we either no change or negative change. That's the most global answer. So when I break that down, my initial assessment of an athlete or a high performer, you know, sometimes we work with non-athletes, is I'm going to go through a very detailed analysis of each of those buckets and figure out what's going on with their hidden stressors, what's going on with their visible stressors, what's their recovery capacity look like. And that is going to give us an equation and actually give us quantifiable numbers and explain how much adaptability they have. That's all we have to do. From there, then we have to just monitor and deploy stressors in the right spots that we want them to be in, remove them from the spots we don't want them to be in, so we can push more adaptation because the total stress load can stay the same, but you're getting more stress from the areas you want and less from the areas you don't want. And or can we up the lever on the recovery capacity? That's the most broad way to think about it. And I can certainly go through kind of each subcategory if you want. Please, please. And give please. more detail. Yeah, please. Okay, so we'll start off with what I call visible stressors. And I call them mm -hmm. this because they tend to be symptomatic. They tend to be obvious. People tend to, they know the difference. Um, this is stuff like emotional stress. This is psychological stress, right? So you're going to feel depressed. You're going to feel like you can't focus. You're going to feel all these things. And a lot of the times, visible stressors are habits and activities that you know are not beneficial, but you're doing them anyways. Right. Right. So right. like, I don't need to talk about, hey, you're spending too much time on, we, we all know Twitter and okay, all these things, right? So if that's giving you a negative emotional reaction, then stop fucking spending so much time on TikTok. Like, what are you doing? Um, obviously psychology and emotional and mental health and like this is a very large topic. It's not just as simple as well, don't go on the internet. But we want to check those boxes off, right? So we have various evidence-based screens that we'll run, then we have specialists in these areas that we'll go to if we need. And we're gonna really try to run a diagnostic and figure out do you have a ton of stress in that area, yes or no? Are you a professional athlete? Are you a really just high strung person? Are you, do you handle stress well, do you not, et cetera? And, and just where are you landing on that spectrum? And I guess one thing I should have said to, before I started all this is nobody's perfect in anything, but what it really comes down to is me saying, okay, what do I need to spend the most time on with you? Because everyone could get better emotional regulation. Everyone could get better psychological, everyone. But it's like, hey, you're pretty good here, but we have these massive holes over here, 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 and here. You, you, because you just, you don't have time to do everything. You can't employ every single positive health practice anyone's ever said on the internet. Right. So with, with people, you have to figure out what are the two to three to four most important things. Mm -hmm. and so if we go through and go, hey, you know what? Like, I don't think your biggest problem, your biggest stressor is not emotional health. Okay, great. And we might give them some small recommendations. Hey, maybe try this or this or this, but I'm, I'm not going to call these what we call severe performance anchors, right? So an anchor is something that holds you back, right? Um, so what happens is if any one of these categories with invisible or hidden stressors or recovery capacitor is, is severe, this anchor is just dragging you. And all we have to do is lift up that anchor and you start, you, you go faster just because you're not, something's not dragging you back. And this is typically people are just like, I just don't know why, like, I don't know what's, what's, that's a performance anchor. And so the analogy we'll give is if you're in a car and you're going down and you want to go faster, I said, great. Most people assume the best way to do that is to put their foot in the accelerator. But if your foot is already partially pushing the brake down, all you're going to do by pushing the accelerator is rev the engine more you might go a little faster, but you're most likely to blow something up. The easier route is just take your foot off the brake. And then you're going to go a lot faster. And if you still want to go faster after that, now we can push down the accelerator. But if you push down the accelerator while your foot's in the brake, you're just going to blow your engine. 
So first step is figuring out, is our foot on the brake? If so, how much? A little bit, a lot, way down. Well, I'm not even fucking with accelerators. If your foot is smashing down and your e-brakes on and we're skidding and tires are pulling, we have got to back off first. And then you'll actually go faster by just pulling your feet off the brake. It's like times in, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, it's kind of like times in by zero in mathematics. You could have the totally. biggest number in the world, but times by zero, you get zero. Totally. So if your foot's just kind of like lightly tapping the brake, then I might be like, you know what? Let, let's just hit the accelerator. We're okay. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have your foot perfectly off. But if your foot's kind of smashed or your foot is on a brake and the e-brake's up and, and your arm's out grabbing poles, trying to hold things, there's, just, <laughs> there's no point. So... Um, there's a lot of things within these categories, but the visible ones, um, other important visible ones, hydration, sleep. And so let's say for sleep, we, we identify, hey, there's a lot of uh, issues and there's a bunch of different things that go into sleep. Um, you know, we might, we might come out and say, hey, you know what? Um, sleep's not where we want it to be. So sleep is gonna be a function of a handful of things. It's gonna be psychology. And we're gonna run some diagnostics on that. It's going to be physiology, and we're going to collect blood and urine and saliva and figure out what's your dopamine, what's your serotonin, what's your melatonin, what's your cortisol, where is your DHEA? Like, where are these things at? Is this a physiological problem that either you can't get to sleep, you can't stay asleep, or you can't sleep long enough? If it's not physiology or psychology, then we're going to go to an environment, and we're going to run a scan on your environment. So we're gonna look at the temperature in your room. We're gonna look at the airflow. We're gonna look at what's called the CO2 cloud. So this is the amount of CO2 that you're breathing out. It's sitting over your face and you're rebreathing that CO2. We're gonna measure that. We're gonna look at the organic acids and the volatiles coming out of your mattress. We're gonna look at the particulates in the air and the allergens. And we're gonna quantify all of that. And then if it's not that, um, so it's not, then is there some other pathology? So we're gonna do a full, what's called PSG, sleep study. So we're gonna have uh, EEG measures. We're gonna measure oxygen saturation. We're gonna measure uh, movements in your chest. We're gonna look at is this happening when you're on your left side, on your right side, on your back. And when we take a, that kind of a depth analysis of all four of those, we fix sleep. It, it's, it, it's over. There's just nothing we can miss at that point. So we're gonna be able to figure out, is this again, a sleep habit issue? Is this a routine issue? Like what's the problem here? Or is your sleep actually pretty good? And Hey, while we could improve that, the biggest area is actually the fact that your physical training is not appropriate. So all this stuff goes into just the visible side. Right. So were these the these were the hidden stresses? Those are all visible stressors. Visible stresses. So can we talk about the actual, I guess, the intentional stresses, the kind of training programs that we would kind of do if we were to say optimize for perhaps strength? Yep. So that's still a visible stressor because you, mm -hmm. you know, your workouts or whatever. So within that category, um, we're going to analyze what stimuli do you need to get the adaptations you're looking for. So are you a general practitioner? Are you wanting strength? Are you wanting hypertrophy? So let's say we have that differentiation, just strength versus hypertrophy. Then we're going to ask a bunch of other questions, right? Are you 20? Are you 40? Are you a professional athlete? What's our time frame? Do we have six weeks? Do we have six years? Like, what are we looking to do here? But let's say, let's just make up a scenario. We have the answer to that thing. In general, we're going to look at and say, okay, what can you recover from? Um, what do the rest of your stressors look like? Mm. And so, for example, if you've got a bunch of, not to jump the gun here, but if you've got shortcomings in physical recovery and you've got a bunch of hidden stressors, like say your gut microbiome is suboptimal, you've got um, cortisol is, is out of control, you've got... Uh, a B5 and zinc deficiency, you've got maybe some heavy metal overload, et cetera. Well, we might get better response out of your training. We probably will by fixing your physiological environment because it's maybe not the training program. It's the fact that your physiology is in a compromised position. So you're not going to get adaptations. So I don't need to design, or in fact, I may have to design a training program to be lower because I know you don't have the physiology to handle that unlike your training partner or something who doesn't have um, micronutrient deficiencies or mineral overloads. And so all that stuff is gonna come from our hidden stressor um, analysis. But to give you, I guess, some more direct answers. In general, 
for someone looking to develop strength, you're probably going to do a higher intensity. And by intensity, I mean percentage of your one rep max. So heavier. And you're going to do a lower interest set load. So you're going to be doing sets of one to five reps, something like that. When it comes to hypertrophy, we're probably looking to do something anywhere between sets of you know, five up to even sets of 30. But because you're doing way more reps per set, the intensity has to go way down. So a very, very classic, easy to remember analogy would be um, for strength is what I call my three to five principle. So pick three to five exercises, do it three to five times per week, do three to five reps per set, do three to five total sets, uh, and um, rest for three to five minutes in between each one. And go kind of as heavy as you can within that range. So if you're feeling great, maybe you do five sets and five exercises. If you're feeling kind of crappy, maybe that's only three sets and three exercises. So it, it has a large variation, even within that three to five. You know, need an extra day off, do it three times this week. Don't do it four times or five times. For hypertrophy, you probably want um, much higher. So you probably want something like at least 10 working sets per muscle group per week at minimum, probably closer to 15 or 20 is what we're looking. So the volume, the amount of reps and sets you do is significantly higher for hypertrophy, but the precision is lower. So you can kind of do set of six, set of 10, set of 15, as long as you get the muscular failure for hypertrophy, the other variables are not nearly as important. Um, you have to get heavy for strength development, unless you're very, very untrained. So that it's a little bit different. It's why I'll say that hypertrophy training is kind of idiot proof, as long as you work hard. Strength training takes like a little bit more understanding of what you're doing. And in terms of, I guess, strength training versus hypertrophy training, how do these uh, those two things impact upon, say, things like hormones, like in terms of like testosterone? Does one produce a, is one perhaps better for testosterone optimization? Does one uh, diminish it? I'm curious what the kind of relationship is there. Well, my first reaction is I don't, I don't think you care as much as you think you care about that answer. Um, that's my, and we could go down that if you want. Uh, my second one is no, I don't think there's any evidence to actually suggest a certain rep range is more beneficial um, for things like testosterone and growth hormone than any other rep range given you're, you're talking about roughly equivalent volumes, right? So obviously right, if you go to right. the gym and do one set of one at 10% and then going in and doing five sets of 10, it's, it's going to be significantly better, right? So if you're talking about a, like roughly equivalent effort mm -hmm. and volumes, um, no, I don't think so. And the other caveat here is assuming you're at a normal uh, testosterone, if you're going from subclinical then that's, that's a different conversation. If you're using exogenous testosterone, that's a different conversation. So for most people, um, I would not at all gear your training programs around trying to optimize your that's hormone that's that's levels. I think it's, um, we have a, more than enough evidence to suggest that's just totally unneeded at this point. That's really interesting. And I'd love to, to kind of just pick up on this. So, so far we've been talking, I guess, about strength training, high, uh, hypertrophy training. I'm curious to know how these things perhaps relate to um, longevity. Um, is it a case that perhaps muscle and I guess, I, don't, I hate to use the term, but anti-aging or biohacking as, as the term, what's the kind of relationship, I guess, between muscle and longevity? Well, it's a strong one, right? Hmm. So the thing about muscle is it's, you like my pun there, by the way? What did you say? Sorry. What was it? It's a strong, it's a strong, oh, it's a strong one. <laughs> very good. Very good. <laughs> now, the conflict of interest here. Yeah. I, I said from the jump, the very first thing you asked me about is my interest in muscle. So I always think muscle is mm -hmm. the center of everything physiology. Um, that said, muscle is very clearly impactful for both aging length and quality. And there's, there's just no reproach there. In fact, we have in America, the most central funding agency for health is called NIH, National Institute most of Health. Health yeah. 
one of their sub areas is called NIA, National Institute of Aging. And one of their primary directives is sarcopenia, which is a loss of advanced loss of muscle with aging. So they understand it is a, it's like you're talking hundreds of millions a year spent on aging related research with the goal of preserving muscle. Mm -hmm. Like this is not just like, oh, an exercise scientist thinks muscles. Are this is like very, very clearly a huge priority for aging prevention is muscle maintenance and improvement. And so there's a conversation to be had for both total muscle mass as well as muscle quality. And in general, um, even in fact, a, a review came out a couple of days ago in I think the Journal of Physiology that was showing you know, pretty good evidence regarding the intrinsic factors inside a muscle are highly related to aging quality and lifespan. And I've seen this before in our own work. We've done aging studies in Sweden. We've done twins studies. Um, looking at 90 plus year old athletes and stuff. And like muscle matters a lot. You're going to routinely see it come up as a significant predictor of all course mortality in large database cohort studies, right? So you're talking 70, 80,000, 100, 300,000 people in these studies. And they just kind of take everything, blood pressure, cholesterol levels, stroke history. Routinely, you're going to see leg strength pop up as a massive predictor of mortality. Wow, wow. Constantly. In fact, you're going to see it directly compared to VO2 max as well. And in general, leg strength and leg quality is going to outperform and outpredict mortality, even above things like blood pressure and cholesterol levels. Not that those aren't important, but functionality is massively important. And I could go into a bunch of reasons why muscle strength is important. Um, but one of them, the easy way to think about it is if you're very weak, Everything turns into a one rep max. In other words, <laughs> standing up off the toilet <laughs> is, is an 80% squat, right? Yeah. So what happens is when people get weak, their general physical activity just falls off a cliff. They're not going to go check the mail. They're not going to go for a walk. Like they're not going to go. They're just, this is like, it's, it's, I'm doing a one rep max every time I stand up. They're just going to sit. And when that happens, they just fall off a cliff. So maintaining functionality, particularly in the legs, is critical to maintaining general mobility and movement and physical activity. It's also incredibly important to have foot speed and eccentric foot strength to be able to catch yourself from a fall. So you have to, if you trip or something, you have to have the foot strength or foot speed to be able to move your foot out front, put it in the right position, and the eccentric strength to catch and absorb the fall. Once that goes and you can't do that, you're going to fall and just Google you know, problems with broken hip and how closely those are tied to mor mortality, morbidity. You break a hip after 70, like it's very bad news, like extraordinarily bad news. The reason you break a hip is because you trip and fall. And one, one of the many reasons, one of them, that you trip and fall is because of insufficient leg strength. So it's a very trainable thing. It's a very impactful thing. Um, so to me, like, this is one of the reasons why I like emphasize so much is because of those things. It's totally within your control. It's fairly simple to do, and it has such a multifaceted effect. So like, honestly, go fuck your pharmaceuticals. <laughs> like until you've gotten your leg strength up, like that stuff pales in comparison to how important it is to have a lot of strong muscles. I'm curious about when you talk about high quality muscle, um, and perhaps I'm, I'm being naive here, but is there a difference between... Uh, a training program, say strength training against hypertrophy in terms of a quality of muscle? Or do you mean, in, uh, you know, in terms of lean muscle as in not putting on excess body fat alongside the muscle? I could, I'm just hoping for some clarification. But it... Yeah, so in general, we will talk about muscle in a couple of ways. Muscle size, total amount, as well as muscle quality. So muscle quality is a function of a bunch of things. Uh, it's this kind of colloquial term, we'll just say. It could re re uh, refer to marbleization. So is it is it a lot of fat inside muscle or no? It could re refer to the cytokine activity. So these are the kind of the hormones that come directly out of a muscle. Uh, cytokine slash signaling. It could refer to what we'll call specific tension. So that mm -hmm. is the contractile power produced within a muscle cell itself relative to its own size. Um, it's the velocity at which it can contract. Uh, again, just, just the actual individual muscle fibers, not the whole muscle size, not how high you can jump or how fast you can run. The actual functionality of that single cell to contract with speed. 
Um, it could refer to its energetic properties um, and its, its mitochondria and everything else that go into its aerobic capacity, glycolytic capacities. All that is going to be summed up into general muscle quality. I would love to ask uh, perhaps a kind of question that uh, I'm sure might offend a few people, but when I ask uh, just in terms of perhaps an optimal training program, I was looking, I was watched um, a documentary on Netflix quite recently called Game Changers, and it oh, was sure. all <laughs> and it was all about the idea of perhaps you know a, a vegan uh, diet perhaps being this thing, and and I will say that I thought they did this absolutely crazy study in there, total BS about a, a guy's erectile uh, strength. I don't know if you saw this. It was it was complete nonsense. But I thought, but the premise I, I found quite an interesting one. So I'd love to ask you, uh, what would be perhaps the relationship between, say, something like a vegan diet and uh, athletic performance, if you would? I guess if the question is, can you perform very well athletically on a vegan diet? The yeah. answer is yes. Yeah, no, no doubt. I, I don't think any rational scientist would dispute that. Um, if you think it's going to make you live longer going vegan relative to a equally equivalent high nutrient uh, diet, then you're, you're, you're a bit out of your mind. If you think that, um, animal products and stuff are deleterious to your health, again, in a, in a fair context, then you're, you're, I don't, like, I don't even find those, con those conversations interesting, honestly. Like, it, it's, it's the equivalent of being like, oh, you know what? You could drink water only, you know, live long. You're like, yeah, yeah, let me make a documentary. Like, what? This is fucking stupid. This is, this, this is not an actual intellectual conversation. You're not actually, like, you, there's no semblance of honesty here. So I'm not gonna engage I don't find it interesting at all. It's it's not real. It's fake. You know it's fake. You know you just made all this stuff up. Like, if you can't watch that and think that all that's or all overwhelming majority that's just clearly fake, then like I, I just don't know what to tell you. So next question. What about fasting? What about it? What would uh, how would that I guess pertain to? Uh, do you think that it'd be possible to do that and perhaps achieve say elite athletic performance? And when I say fasting, I kind of mean uh perhaps something like a 16 to 8 intermittent fasting or perhaps a one uh day per week total fast or do you think that would just be total detriment to the nutrients required so again the question is could it be done yeah of course i have athletes that do it but you know like i don't i don't like to eat breakfast in the morning or i don't like to eat super late at night sure it totally depends on the sport mm -hmm. are we talking a pga golfer we talking um, a UFC fighter who does a little bit of fasting in between their fights, and then when they get to fight camp, they come off it. We talking about Olympic weightlifter? Like we talking about an NBA player? I work with all these people, right? You, you, there's I would not have one answer that qualif that works perfectly for all of them. Um, that question with both of these uh, fasting and other stuff, it's not a matter of like can this be done. It's a matter of is it necessary? Is it mm -hmm. better than something else? Um, and that, that's very, very different than can this be done? And if you look across, you know, there's how many billion of us? Eight, nine. You're going to find some number of thousands of people who can do really weird things. Like that's not, and I don't even define like a 16-8 as like a weird thing. It's, it's, that's super manageable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a matter of like, is it better? What are the pros or the cons? That's how you should think about all these interventions is, What's the potential upside? What's the potential downside? And then what's my exact experience? What's my, um, what, what, what adaptations am I needing to drive? What functionality am I trying to drive? And that's going to be your answer. But yeah, of course it can be done. Yeah, I was just curious about that one because for me, since I was very young, I've always followed uh, a hypertrophy training program. And for whatever reason, I just generally don't seem to get hungry at breakfast time. So for me, it's kind of natural to, I guess, follow, say, something like a 16 to 8 uh, program. I find that I sleep better. I still get quite a lot of calories in. Helps me stay relatively lean, I would say. Uh, but this, I guess this kind of brings me on to my, to my next question, because something that I've been toying with lately, I think that after 12, 13 years of, I guess, kind of just following 
a, a split of push pull legs push pull legs then i kind of uh switched up recently i've started doing things like uh i started just doing more i guess more functional movements i kind of started you know tr almost trying with some crossfit stuff i kind of went back to some athletic stuff and it was interesting for me because i was worried that when i would go back to i guess more of my routine training program that that would kind of have been detrimental to it but i i actually found that it was almost like the opposite um so i'm kind of curious do you think that kind of periodization periodization or i guess kind of trying other things can necessarily be perhaps a good thing or do you think that depending on what it is it's better to just be faithful to a specific program and I know it's another general question. I do apologize. <laughs> so you're talking the outcome goals hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. I think it's very clear a couple of things. And my, I guess my answer is it's both. It's in between. Right. So such that if you just hop programs every week, that's a good recipe of getting nothing done. If you hop programs every three or four weeks, a good recipe of getting nothing done. At the same end, on the other side of the coin, if you do the exact same style of training for a year or five years or 10, that's a very good recipe of getting nothing done. So you want to have what we call, this is, so when we talk about program design or periodization, we have this phrase we call variation, right? And variation is intentional changing and manipulation of what we call our manipulatable variables. All right, so I just use the same words to define the same words, but it, it works. That's not randomization. And this is the big difference. If you can understand variation versus randomization, that is the key here. So randomization is just doing different things for the sake of doing different things. That's a recipe of getting injured. It's a recipe of not getting very many adaptations or getting adaptations very slowly. You don't wanna just do random stuff. This is the problem with CrossFit. This was the problem with P whatever X thing, whatever that was years ago. It's just random stuff, right? Well, I'll put it this way. This was the problem with bad CrossFit coaching. It's just like, oh, we're gonna do today. Like, ah, uh, 50 sit-ups, uh, 400 meters spread. Oh, you'll never know what's going on. Great, you're like, well, that's great. But there's no intentional progression here. There's no specific dosing. There's no adaptation. And there is, but it's very long because you're just doing random stuff. Good CrossFit coaching is, you know, variations, but planned repeats of certain things to make sure you get, it. and there are good CrossFit coaches. Point, point being here, Variation is intentional manipulation of exercise choice, the range of motion, the type of exercise, right? dumbbell versus barbell versus machine, um, eccentric, concentric, you know, range of motion, the exercise order, so which order you do them in in the workout, the volume, so the reps and the sets, the intensity, how heavy it is, the rest intervals, all of these things should be intentionally manipulated probably every six to 10 weeks, depending on your, your skill level and training and all that stuff. So yes, you, you want some variation, but it wants to be intentional and with some forethought, not just random. But if you just do the same workout kind of every day, um, it'll work for a while, but after that, it, it, it's gonna fall pretty quickly. Really interesting. And I'm wondering if you could give us an overview of uh... The newly coined phrase, the Galpin method. <laughs> um, that's that's all on Andrew. Um, so he called me one day and was like, dude, I just spent like five hours on your YouTube. I was like, geez, that's kind of crazy. He's like, yeah, I just went nuts and watched all your hypertrophy videos and <laughs> watched all your hydration videos. And he's like, this is so good. He's like, that equation in your hydration video is so, so helpful. He's like, I'm going to do a podcast or whatever tomorrow. He's like, uh, I'm going to call it the Galpin equation. And I was like, what? Don't do that. And he's like, I'm going to do that. I was like, whatever. So thank you, Andy Huberman, for the Galpin equation. Um, all I did is I took very basic science, which if you're in this hydration field, you'll know that um, there's been a number of studies that have shown, I guess the basic question is, how much do you have to drink during exercise to maintain hydration and performance? Because we know that if you lose hydration to enough, of a level and like typically you'll see as little as 2% body weight reduction via hydration can start to have detriment and neural performance and cardiovascular performance and muscular performance. 
So therefore, if I'm doing a long bout of training, how much fluid do I need to take in to make sure that I don't have those precipitous fall-offs? And the general answer is something like two milliliters per kilogram per 15 minutes. And if you do that, like you're gonna be in a good spot. And I was just like, well, in America, at least, no one has any idea what milliliters are, and they don't think of their body weight in kilograms. So can I just come up with a quicker equation in the units that they work? And I just said, all right, just take your body weight and divide it by 30. And so if you're 150 pounds and you divide it by 30, that's five. So that tells you how many ounces, five ounces in this case, to drink every 15 or 20 minutes. So that's all that equation really is. is it helps people to say, take your body weight, divide it by 30. And that's how many ounces to consume every 15 or 20 minutes in a long workout um, to maintain hydration in the, the training session. Right. And uh, for the people listening, I guess five ounces here, that would be, I guess, in about one fifth of a liter here. Well, I, mean, you know, I, could, I could do this thing in, in uh, oh, yeah, sure. actual scientific units if you want. Yeah, sure. Because I have to, had to convert it to these stupid American units to make it there. Um, so two milliliters per kilogram per minute. So if you weigh 70 kilos, right, the two, per, so you do 140 milliliters every 15 or so minutes. Love it. Pretty simple. Pretty simple, right? Love it. That's a very, very useful formula. Uh, we, we'll clip this one. Um, so I just have to just ask you a couple of uh, questions that uh, we were asked. Um, the the golden question, I guess, that everyone wants to know is uh, if somebody wanted to, I guess, optimize themselves, um, you know, let's just say perhaps for something like strength training, uh, what kind of supplements would you kind of look at there. That's not steroids. Uh, um, well, steroids are going to work the best in terms of if you want to grow muscle mass. Uh, I, I just say I don't, I don't, I don't work this way in general. So, if I'm ever going to recommend supplementation, uh, two thoughts here. Number one, um, food first and lifestyle first. So I, I hate giving supplement recommendations to people until they've figured out their sleep. So instead of spending 300 bucks on supplementation, you should like figure out your sleep environment, right? And make sure run diagnostics on, maybe you've got allergens in the air, maybe you've got other things going on. So there's just better ways to spend your money to figure out those rocks because those are going to move testosterone way more than a little bit of rhodiola, right? right. It's gonna move for the same way. It's just gonna be it's so much more, like it's so many orders of magnitude better. Um, a higher nutrition, higher quality diet, uh, stress management. Like I'm just, I'm telling you guys, I've run the labs on thousands of professional athletes and I have the most advanced analytics I, of, of anybody you're gonna see for sleep diagnostics. Like no one can do this environmental stuff that we do. No one can do the, the blood and the stool and the urine stuff that we do. And I, I can't express to you enough, the biggest changes we get in people's, any of these metrics you want are from the visible stressors. It's not even close. Like it's not like a little bit. It is, we have doubled, we have tripled, we've quadrupled people's testosterone without any supplementation. Like we, I've done this routinely. Um, we have, like, I can't hear that, like all the metrics you care about. Um, we just, we just had a professional athlete who was having like 280 sleep episodes per night, right? And we ran a sleep study on this individual and found out 80% of those were happening just when he was on his back. So all we did is bought a $15 pillow, put it on his low back. So he couldn't lay on his back at night. So he slept on his left side or his right side. And we had an 80% reduction in sleep apnea in one night. Wow. And those problems are now gone. So he just wears that. He sleeps perfectly throughout the night. And his testosterone tripled after two months. And this is the highest level of highest level of athlete. Like, but that's all I had to do. That, that's it, right? Um, so like we can talk about all these things, but like you really, like you really have to figure those other things out first. The rest of the shit is just like it's gonna move the needle, maybe like a few percentage points to a level that you will not even feel the difference. I promise you. But if you get your hydration figured out, if you can get a better training program, if you can figure out how to breathe through your nose and do some other stuff like this, you will feel these differences very quickly. The differences you get from legal supplements are very unlikely to be at a level, is to be at a level that would be statistically significant in science, but very little clinical application here. Like you're not going to feel that much different. So having said all that, 
yeah, we do use supplements a lot, um, but only after we've run full labs. Mm -hmm. That's that's the only way we do it. And then we're getting, we're going to build them a diet and, and nutrition plan that covers the macro and micronutrients in their food. So you shouldn't need much help after that. The only reason we tend to go to supplements is because we're working on quicker time domains than the average person, right? So it's like, hey, the season starts in six weeks or I'm in season now. Um, I'm a fighter. I'm training twice a day. I've got to fight in five weeks, sometimes three times a day. Like we, we, those are not normal situations. So food's not going to get us there. Oh, especially by the way, we have to lose 30 pounds. So like, I can't, I can't give you all the nutrients you need while calories have to go down. So now enter supplementation. Um, so that is my general real answer to supplements. I mean, outside of that, you know, fish oil, creatine, multivitamins, these things are like, it's, I know it's boring, but the reality of it is those do have the most scientific evidence. They work. They work to a level that matters. Beta alanine uh, is very effective. Um, beetroot juice seems to be quite effective. Um, and then and there's some other ones. Caffeine, of course, works very well. Um, you know, essential amino acids, if you're not, you don't have sufficient nutrients, uh, protein lines. Those are the ones that cause, like, those are the, the, the Mount Rushmore for a reason. They're the most effective. Like, you can start going down lower to rhodiolas and stuff, and they do have some evidence. But now it's gone from, hey, you've got 65 human trials to, like, four human trials to, like, one. So, well, there was a study in cell culture. Okay, great. And, like, some people get super excited that a mechanism is demonstrated. But to me, like, again, why are you wasting time here when you have a supplement over here? That's equally cheap that has been shown to work in humans 44 times. Like I know everyone just gets excited about the new and fresh stuff. Oh, I've never heard of this. I never heard. I promise you, the effect of this is, is it's gonna pale in comparison to creatine. Like everything's gonna pale in comparison. Creatine is just it's so effective. It has such an order of magnitude, such a high safety profile, and it works on so many areas. Uh, cognitive improvements, neurological improvements, strength and physical improvements. Like, it's just ridiculous. Um so, Does it cause hair loss? No. No? That's good. No, it doesn't cause kidney failure. It doesn't cause hair loss. All those things. That's good. My, my last audience uh, question. Uh, they basically, uh, a question which came up, I would say, repeatedly, maybe about four or five questions we were asked about it, was in terms of uh, taking blood work, so perhaps some biochemistry, and what should be some of the markers that we should look for to optimize? So... A couple of things. Um, I did like a, I don't know, 45 minute um, kind of Q&A just on this. Mm -hmm. And I put it up on my YouTube. So you can watch the whole thing if you want to hear more specifically about what markers to get. Uh, in general though, like if, if you're looking for just general health, uh, you know, just a basic CBC or CMP. So complete blood count and cardiometabolic panel are, are fine to start. Um, they're going to be able to tell you, most physicians or anybody's going to be able to tell you, like, hey, you, you're you about to die, you know, whatever or not. Outside of that, I generally recommend people don't waste your time on blood panels. Unless you know what you're doing, interpreting them, and the overwhelming majority of people do not. They just look at the reference range that's printed on the sheet and says, I guess everything's kind of close, you're fine. But that's because physicians have just been trained to look for clinical deficiencies, well, not having a clinical deficiency is not the same thing as performance optimization. So if you have somebody who's experienced in looking at blood for performance optimization in athletes, that's great. Um, like that's something obviously we do. Um, and we obviously do that for a, a lot of other non-athletes as well. We could just take blood. We'll give you a basic interpretation of it and you know, and tell you what follow-up test to get if you need them or and then give you a program, nutrition program supplementation program or something if you want. Um, but that's that's the basic CDC CMP is is the basic place to start there. Um, from there, if you can match that up with symptomology uh, and or some other screens, then you have pretty good insight. But in general, that would be my recommendation. So it's fine, a really highly, uh, highly qualified person. You know, I love Ben House. Ben does great stuff. Tommy Wood, they do great stuff. Um, I trust those folks. Mike Nelson. Uh, it does great stuff. Um, so these are all people who are, are qualified to look at this performance side of, of blood. There's other folks too, but those ones kind of are top of mind. Well, get somebody like that, hire them and spend 
you know, whatever those guys charge, I don't know, um, to get a real true interpretation, because you can look at the blood and you can see things behind the blood that people don't know about. Um, and that's, that's generally what we do, right? So I can see things in the blood, like if I can look at your lymphocyte, the uh, neutrophil ratio, and I can actually infer some things of like, mm, you may be immunosuppressed, you may actually have potential signs of infection. It doesn't mean you have these things, but then we would go follow up and directly test those to confirm or deny you have those. Um, we can like we can look at albumin and get an indication of hydration status. Like there's all kinds of stuff we can do um, looking at anion gap. And you, you can just go calculate your own anion gap. You can cool that equation and figure out kind of, you know, if you're if you're over 15, like you have some real potential problems. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you can glean from it if you can kind of poke around a little bit. Um, I know Ben House has a blood interpretation course. So you can go buy that and take that course if you want. You can start with our free video on YouTube or whatever. Um, so those are all some resources to think about. Some real interesting uh, stuff in there to consider. Uh, man, I've got one last question for you that we ask at the end of all our podcasts, and then I'll just ask you then where these guys can connect with you and then any links that you want us to include below, then you can just swipe up on this, this episode. Um, so, man, my last question for you today that we ask at the end of all our podcasts is, what makes a life worth living? I don't know. Um, I don't think I have any particular insight on that. Um, would probably have to think. I could certainly rattle some shit off right now, but it would be top of the cup answers and probably not well thought through. And I don't think that's particularly helpful because I'd probably, we'd probably hang up this call in an hour from now and be like, no, nah, I don't believe that. Actually, I don't think that's true. I think that, and I'd probably come up with a better answer. So um, I don't know how often your guests don't give you an answer, but uh, that's, I, I, I try to, when I'm on podcasts, I honestly, I try to give you my honest answer. I don't like just saying shit to have answered. So I, I don't think I have a good answer for you. Is how I'm gonna stick with it. It's absolutely fine, man. Where can these guys connect with you? Well, if you want to follow along on social media, Instagram and Twitter are the the best places for sure. Uh, I pretty much just use those to put out science and science -y shit like that. If you want to take some courses from me, that's all free on YouTube. Same thing, just Google Andy Galpin. You could basically take all my nutrition or strength training. Um, I got videos up there, by the way, breaking down you know, the exact protocols for strength training, exact protocols for hypertrophy, exact protocols for endurance. Those are all up on YouTube. Hydration stuff is up there. If you want to know the science of muscle physiology of hypertrophy, those, those are all up there. And you got hours and hours of videos to kick around with if you want more detail. Um, and then I have some other stuff coming. Um, you could probably get most of it on my website, andygalpin.com. And um, if you're really, really interested uh, and doing some different stuff, like with the, the absolute rest, um, my, my sleep company and some other stuff, then, you know, you can reach out via my website. It's probably the easiest way to get a hold of us. We'll link everything below. I love the quote yours that I found, which said that you wanted to enhance the human condition by providing the world with free and entertaining health, human performance and nutrition education. And I certainly feel that uh, you've brought a lot of great value to our audience today. So I just want to pay my my respect and my admiration to you, Andy. And uh, once again, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Yeah, my pleasure, man.